Jim Otto was an original Raider at the center of it all. From 19 straight losses in the early 60s to Oakland's last minute win in the Heidi Bowl. He was there for the Raiders' first ever Super Bowl. In 1972, he even caught a pass in a playoff game in Pittsburgh, although everyone remembers the game for another reception. In his second to last game, he snapped the ball for the famous Sea of Hands catch, the Raiders' most dramatic playoff win ever. By the time he was done, he had played in 308 straight games, the most in Raider history. I've had 39 surgeries. I've had 28 knee surgeries. Both knees are artificial. I've had eight artificial knees. We loved to play football. We beat the hell out of each other and had a great time doing it. At that particular time, I thought maybe I shouldn't have done it, but as soon as you uh, heal up a little bit, you think, gosh, I'd do it again. His pro football playing career lasted longer than anyone else's. Hall of Famer George Blanda, who played 26 seasons, many of them with the Oakland Raiders, died Monday at age 83. His career began in 1949 with the Chicago Bears. He retired after his ninth season with the Raiders in 1976, one month shy of his 49th birthday. He spent 10 seasons with Chicago, part of one with Baltimore, and seven with the Houston Oilers before going to Oakland. Blanda scored 2,002 points in his career, a pro football record at the time of his retirement. He kicked 335 field goals and 943 extra points, ran for nine touchdowns, and threw for 236 more. Perhaps Blanda is best known for a five-game stretch in 1970, when he led the Raiders to four wins in one tie with late touchdown passes or field goals. George Blanda, dead at age 83. John Klobuchar, The Associated Press. Cornerback Willie Brown was a college linebacker who went undrafted in 1963. When he joined the AFL's Denver Broncos, he helped revolutionize bump and run coverage. I got directly in front of the receiver and uh, I said, well, if I knock him down and get my hands on him, I knew that there's no place for him to go. So I tried it and it worked out for me fine. He was a ball hawk that would disrupt the things that you were trying to get accomplished. Brown playing up nose to nose with Snow. Back goes Gabe to pass. He looks, sets up, he's in trouble, runs to the left, throws on the move. Batted up here. Willie Brown still fighting for an interception. He's got it at the 30 and goes out of bounds on the 26-yard line. He was so good that forget about it. He was going to cover somebody like a blanket. Brown intercepted 54 passes in his 16-year career. Though he spent 12 years in Oakland, he didn't fit the mold of the typical Raider. He came from the old school. He wasn't flashy. He didn't talk a lot of smack, which a lot of Raiders did back then, Atkinson and Tatum and those guys. You respected the guy because he was a good guy. As a matter of fact, 1973, I went to the Pro Bowl and Willie had those black Raider armbands. And I said, Willie, let me have those armbands. He said, here you go. <laughs> and I wore them the rest of my career. And the guy says, why are you switched to those on the elbows? I said, man, I got these from Willie Brown. <laughs> Brown not only influenced styles, but also influenced the outcomes of some of the Raiders' biggest wins. Brown had seven career postseason interceptions, including three returned for touchdowns. And he looks and throws. Intercepted by the Oakland Raiders. Willie Brown at the 30, 40, 50. He's going all the way. Old man Willie, touchdown Raiders. 
that's what you remember about Willie Brown the most is the big play. And you know what? I can't get this out of my mind. Since I've been talking to you, I've seen it about five or six times. Him intercepting that ball and running it back against us in 1970. He was always there in the big play. is what Gene Upshaw did best. In his 15-year career with the Silver and Black, Oakland had just one losing season. The Silver and Black, New Orleans, here come the Raiders. And Upshaw remains the only player in NFL history to play in Super Bowls in three different decades. This was our finest hour. This was the finest hour in the history of the Oakland Raiders. Central to the success of those teams was the running game with the player known as Highway 63 often paving the way. The Oakland line is just wiping out Minnesota's front. He had them big arms with all the big pairs on just throwing these things, and guys just be pouncing off them. We should run down these guys' throat. Gene would pull from his left guard position. He would get out there so fast and just attack you, just run people over, and those backs would get right on his backside. You couldn't even see the back because he was so big. It's sort of nice when you turn the corner and you look into that defensive back's face and he looks a little frightened because he's got 260 pounds running there. You okay, Pitts? Huh? Pitts, I hit him with a forearm while ago, so he's out. He's not on his feet. Let alone watch him become one of the great offensive linemen. I watched him take over the Oakland Raiders. Whoa, let's go, buddy. Get after him. We got him down. Now don't let up. We got to go to work. One o'clock tomorrow. Everybody on time. Come on, Phil. Come on, let's get it out of here. There's nothing more brutal than an offensive guard slugging it out on every down. When you got that guy being the leader of your team, that's a guy you want to follow. But yeah, we're glad he's in. Uh, unfortunately, you know, he's passed away, so. You know, uh, the family's here to get that whole experience, you know, so Kenny is missing a hell of a party, believe me. But I know he's up there looking down and smiling at everybody. But, uh, yeah, I'm happy he's in. He's finally in. He's, he's well-deserved and should have been in a little years ago. Well, he was a great leader. You know, he was a great leader that, uh, that really gave off uh, a sense of success all the time, you know, a sense uh, that we were going to win. And he had control of the ball game up there, you control the team, and uh, that, that's what a leader has to do. And he was that all the way around, no matter what it was. Kenny had control of the game, the team, uh, the players, the personnel you had on the field, knew how to use everybody, and to be successful with everybody, he never really put anybody in a bad position. He always called plays that guys were going to look great. And that's, that was one of the big assets that Kenny had, you know, and he was a great guy. I, I, I always uh, approach you know, playing football as a commitment. And you're committed to being the best you can be, and that's really developing and getting in shape, doing your job, and committing yourself to be a, a good team, teammate, guys, you know. And I always, I, I love being so committed because I didn't want to be the one to make the mistake to let the team down. Hall of Fame left tackle Art Shell was drafted to stop the best defensive lineman of his day. For 15 seasons, his greatness was a reflection in a mirror. It was measured by the success his opponents didn't have. I always thought one of the guys that changed the game of professional football was Fred Dean because San Diego Chargers started moving him around. Now it's it's a regular part of the pack, defensive package. Find out who the weak sister is and put your best player on. Well, Fred Dean was the first guy that did that. And the reason the Chargers did that was he couldn't beat Art Shell. He was very tough, very mentally tough, but he was also gifted athletically. He had strength. He had a great punch. He could run block. His feet were remarkable. We had a pretty good rivalry with the Steelers. He and Dwight White had some really good battles. Dwight White, I enjoyed playing against him. 
one time we ran a run play, and he told me, you won't get it again. We come back, run the same play, we gain more yards. That's the last time you won't get it again. Our quarterback called it six times in succession. That's just the way it was. We were going to get ours. From the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena, California, it is Super Bowl XI. We have the utmost respect for that front four. Jim Marshall, Carl Eller, but we were not going to be denied by anybody. I mean, you could have had Godzilla over there. We were not going to lose that game. Art Shell, number 78, consistently eliminated Jim Marshall. Shell was so overpowering that Marshall did not make a tackle the whole game. The game he had against Jim Marshall in the Super Bowl was just as good a game an offensive lineman could ever have. Jim Parker and Art Shell are the two best left tackles that are in that Hall of Fame. And I don't know if you could split those guys. That's how good Art Shell was. He's either 1 or 1A, one the best ever to play in the National Football League. The player known as the Mad Stork and kick him in the head Ted could seemingly do anything. Whether playing the run, the pass, or blocking more kicks than any player in history. It's brought to the middle, Raiders after the ball. The four-time Super Bowl champion was a man of many teams, many names, and many adventures. I remember Ted Hendricks addressing a group of Hispanics off the balcony of his hotel about five in the morning in fluent Spanish. Ted Hendricks is someone who rode on the practice field on a white horse and another time in camp sat one of those, you know, tables that you see at a Mexican restaurant with the umbrella and had a pitcher of margaritas. There's a Renaissance Fair every year in California and I like to collect a mask every year. I'll wear them driving down the street in the car and to get some very uh, interesting looks from different people, kind of like stare at you, you know, I wonder what kind of human beings behind that mask. Ted Hendricks was one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. <laughs> in business, in television, in football. Ted would come in on Monday morning, hung over from the night before, or maybe it was just a, a, a kind of a continuation of the night before. And we would put up film of the next week's opponent. And Ted would sit there half awake and call out the play they were going to run before they ran it. And I'm, as a young player, you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, how does he know all the answers? Well, he played for Don Shula with the Colts. He's, I mean, the guy's seen every offensive formation and every variation since that time. I remember one time we were playing Miami and they sent someone to crack back on Ted on a sweep that way. And Ted was just so insulted that Don had called that play and, and that Don thought that Ted might not recognize the play and Ted is yelling at Don Shula on the sideline. Don, that's an insult. You can't run that play. I saw that in 71. I've studied the game long enough to know the different blocking techniques that I have to deal with. I've seen it so many times during my career that it just comes natural. There's not very much uh, work involved in it. Ted was a guy who you could line up next to. He would say, look, they're in far formation. I want you to slant inside. That wasn't the huddle call. We'd make the play, get back in the huddle. Ted would say to me, look, when you go in your meeting, you blame it on me. And when I go in my meeting, I'll blame it on you. Ted went where Ted wanted to go. That was the magic of Ted Hendricks. After seven seasons in New England, Mike Haynes joined the Los Angeles Raiders in November of 1983. He wore the silver and black until 1989 and was twice named an All-Pro. 
Mike was like the gentleman Raider. He was kind of outside the mold of what the Raiders are supposed to be on and off the field. Mike was a please and thank you guy. He didn't make any noise about anything. He just played. But when he steps out into the field and he shuts everything down, we didn't care. We didn't care if you sell pink flowers, knock yourself out. really a tough position. You have to like a good challenge and you have to understand that even though they beat you on this one play, that that was just this one play. You need to be able to step back in the huddle and come back again with the same enthusiasm and passion and belief in yourself. That 83 Raider team, I'll put that defense against anybody, anybody. And the whole key was Mike Haynes. Oakland's 1983 season culminated in Super Bowl 18. In that game, Haynes was instrumental in shutting down a Redskins team that at that time was the highest scoring team in NFL history. This guy wasted no motion, nothing. Probably the most efficient player mechanically that I've ever watched. To me, he's the standard by which all corners are made. recruited as a defensive back and then moved to fullback and I don't think you can pretend to be tough. Either you are or you're not. I always felt like football was like the greatest laboratory in the world. You could really examine who you are and find out whether you have the quit in you, whether you have the fight in you. Over 16 years with the Raiders and Chiefs, Marcus Allen often demonstrated his toughness at the goal line. When he retired, Allen's 145 touchdowns were the most of any running back in NFL history. But statistical accomplishments are only a part of his greatness. Here's a guy who's going to the Hall of Fame, who's leading a league in rushing, who's, you know, doing all these things. And oh, by the way, we don't want you to be the running back anymore. We want you to be the fullback because Bo Jackson showed up and Bo's explosive. And so what did Marcus do? He said, fine, I'll be a fullback. So we're back to being a fullback. And a quick pitch to Jackson, getting an Allen block, cuts under it, bangs through Bosworth, touchdown Raiders! Bo Jackson was a phenomenally big, fast man. But as a football player, Marcus Allen was head and shoulders above him. Marcus Allen could catch the ball, Marcus Allen could block, he could do everything. Quick toss to Allen. Comes back right, throwing me. Christensen open. Touchdown, Raiders! Handoff. Sweep right side. Marcus Big Hole, 30, 25. Cuts inside. Got a block, 20. Cuts across the other way. 15, 10. Foot race to the five. Running to the far sideline. He's got in a touchdown! He didn't awe you with great speed. He didn't awe you with phenomenal moves. He was smooth. 
kind of glided. He could run away from me if he had to. You don't know how he did it, but he, he got away from like in the Super Bowl in that one run. Bucket giving to Allen, sending him wide left. He has to reverse his field, but he, and he gets away for a moment. Come back up to the middle, There's no way that he can outrun that team. No way, but he did it. And it always looks like somebody's gonna catch Marcus but they never do. Mark Sal is a pure football player. He could have played defense. He could have been a fullback. He was selfless. He was a complete player. It's the best compliment you can give Marcus. Tom Brady's foot or his ankle in the boot, Plaxico Burris and his uh, prediction. Do you remember if there were any distractions leading up to Super Bowl 18 for you guys? Well, we had all sort of distractions. Uh, I mean, that was sort of typical with being a Raider uh, <laughs> <laughs> player. We had seven guys miss curfew. We had uh, we almost had an incident, uh, our team against their team, in, uh, in a place called Confetti's mm -hmm. a nightclub. They only had one nightclub, I think, in Tampa at that time. And the uh, the two teams met up there, and we had a stare down. So we almost we avoided the confrontation. But there were always a couple of things that uh, uh, made things interesting when I was playing for the Raiders. You know, leading up to the Super Bowl, everyone's always so surprised that an underdog can win the game. You guys were a decided under, uh, underdog to the Washington Redskins. Well, we were surprised, Randy. Seven points or something. We like were that? surprised though because you were. We had. Uh, they had beaten us early in the year, mm -hmm. and it was a high-scoring game. But right. we had, I think, maybe four starters that didn't play. And I think you had, like, five turnovers yep. in that game, too. Absolutely. Uh, Mike Haynes, I think, wasn't with the team uh, mm -hmm. at that time. I didn't play because of a hit pointer. I went in on one play. It was a special teams play. Um, I think Cliff Branch was injured in that game. Uh, Van McElroy, I think he didn't start. Mm -hmm. So we had quite a few starters that didn't play, and we felt uh, – that we, you know, we, we felt that that was, that was, you know, it was a slap in our face that we were the underdogs and uh, we, we knew we were going to beat that game. How much does it mean to you today to see another member of the Raiders family be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? John is, uh, John is a multi-dimensional icon. Uh, he's an icon as a coach. He's an icon as a broadcaster. You and I wouldn't be sitting here making the goofy money that we make. That you make. Well, we all, you know, we all do well. You know, we're, we're fortunate, and I, I think he redefined uh, broadcasting both from a broadcasting standpoint and from an economic standpoint, but also from an endorsement standpoint. But at the end of the day, I think this induction was long overdue. Uh, that's one. And two, uh, I, I, when I say congratulations to John, it's not as John Madden, the broadcaster. It's not as John Madden, the pitch man or uh, the guy that has uh, introduced himself to mul multiple generations of teenagers through his video games, it's John Madden, the coach, because that's what John Madden is in for, Coach John Madden. Howie, thanks for joining us. Very Pleasure. much appreciated. Howie Long, the great Raiders defensive lineman. My mother asked me, how are you doing? And I said, I've got problems. I haven't signed Mike Haynes, Todd Christensen, Lester Hayes, and I named two others. And I said, they just want too much money. Her answer was, without them, what kind of team are you going to have? Give them the money. You can't take it with you. And a lot of Davis dollars have been pumped into the local community this week as uh, billboards congratulating John Madden for his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame are all over town here. And now it was a speech that uh, Al Davis delivered 14 years ago as he was inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame as introduced by that man, John Madden, who in a matter of moments will be introduced by Al Davis, who has flown in all the way from the West Coast to deliver a record ninth introductory speech at a Pro Football Hall of Fame. 
And uh, we we can't wait to hear, not only because he's Al Davis, not only because he's so steeped in history, <laughs> but uh, once again, in case you're joining us, uh, all of the presenters have uh, been given their speeches beforehand to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I have in my hand five of them. There's only five. There's one missing, because one wasn't Who do you currently think that delivered. might be? <laughs> be Al Davis. So well, we don't know sort of what he's going to anything say. Anything could happen here, really. <laughs> <laughs> The ultimate maverick about to introduce John Madden. Uh, and uh, he's got the silver tie, the black shirt. The yeah, he always wears the, the either white sweatsuit or yeah, the black, black suit. Or, right, of course, yeah. the silver. And that's what you always see him, whether it's at the combine or over at the facility. Right. That's, he's uh, silver and black, true and true. I don't know who I'm more anxious to hear, Al Davis or John Madden. Or John Madden. It's certainly going to be quite an entertaining uh, matter of uh, moments. We're about to be uh, privy to. As look, at yeah, look at that. Look at that. They're all here. The, the black hole is very well represented. Uh, and uh, John Madden, he is he's no doubt nervous. And he does have, he appears to be prepared comments under his uh, right arm right there. We can't wait to hear what John is going to say as he's waited 27 years for this moment to come. you got to pull him off the ceiling uh, in Detroit. He was so walking on air when he found out that he was finally going in. And as a coach, too, Steve. As a coach. That's what he wanted as a coach. And he's enjoyed such a great great career. Uh, when I interviewed him back a, a, you know, a month ago, uh, that weekend he was having a party. His, his son was throwing a party at his home. Uh, and he said, I'm going to go practice my speech. There you go. Here's Al Davis. Sit back and enjoy, people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. It's always great to come back to the Hall of Fame today. It's a very emotional an inspirational experience for me to present the great John Madden into the enshrinement in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. John Madden, a brilliant coach, a loyal and trusted friend, a Raider, his record is self-explanatory, 103 victories in 10 years is unparalleled in National Football League history. The Raiders always wanted to have the best organization in professional sports, wanted to have the best players, the best coaches, play in the best games, have the best plays, and have the best record in professional football. And some 40 years ago, I hired a 32-year-old coach to carry the torch for the Raiders and do all the things that I just talked about that we wanted to do. John Madden, over the 10 seasons of his coaching career, he led the Raiders to the playoffs eight of those years, including seven division championships, bringing the Raiders their first world championship. John's 759 regular season percentage ranks as the highest ever with coaches in the National Football League. John coached in the golden era of great coaches. In his ten years, John coached against many who are enshrined in this Hall of Fame. Don Shula of Miami, Chuck Knoll of Pittsburgh, Tom Landry of Dallas, Weave Eubank, Sid Gilman, Hank Stram, Bud Grant, and others who are enshrined in this Hall of Fame. John's first professional head job, he was 32 years old. And John did what you would call the impossible. In his 10 years of coaching against these great legends, he won more games than he lost against every Hall of Fame coach in this great shrine here in the National Football League. His record, and of course his record was the Raiders' record, of 36-16-2 against those great coaches. 
dominating the stage that was Monday Night Football. Madden's teams had a record of 11-1-1, and boy, did the Raiders dominate Monday Night Football. I told you we wanted to play in the greatest games. We wanted the greatest plays. You all remember the Immaculate Reception. You all remember the Heidi game. You all remember Sea of Hands, the Holy Roller, Ghost to the Post, the Lytle Fumble, the miracles of George Blanda, the man on the sideline during all those events that have become synonymous with rate of football was John Madden. He loved the game. He loved his team. He loved the Raiders. He loved this league, and you can see it today in everything he does with his games and his TV work. He loved the AFL and the NFL, and especially his players. And at a time when our country needed it, John Madden saw no color. The Raiders, more than any other organization, politically, football, sports, led the fight for diversity. And John Madden was in the middle of that fight. It was pretty tough in those days, in the 70s and in the early 80s, to lead that fight. But the Raiders had one thing in mind. We wanted to win. And to win, you had to have the best players. And so, as I said, he saw no color. Nine Raider legends, nine, are in this hall. The indestructible Jim Otto, he's here today the great clutch player George Blanda, the undefeated Willie Brown who was only beaten by Father Time as a cornerback, the magical hands of Fred Blitnikoff, the famed Highway 63 and 78, Gene Upshaw, President of the Players Association, and Art Shell, head coach of the Raiders. Ted Hendricks is here today, the great linebacker, and of course, the ghost of the post, Dave Casper, along with myself, have waited patiently for some 25 years for John to join us as enshrined in this Hall of Fame. We recognize you, Virginia Madden, that's John's wife, his sons Mike and Joey, they were a football family so that John could pursue his dreams. Because when you worked for Al Davis and you worked for the Raiders, there was no time for golf. There was no time for the kids. There was one thing, Raider football, silver and black football. <laughs> to Virginia, our friendship will always continue. You were there when it was important and we'll be there for you. Today is a day when our heroes of the past become our legends of the future. I said this before, time never really stops for the great ones. We wrap them in a cloak of immortality and remember what great people they were. It's a great inspiration for me to come to this field of dreams every year. I've had the honor to present nine other people, eight who played for the Raiders, one who played for the San Diego Chargers, the great Lance Allworth. But I love to come here because I wanted to pay tribute to this great class, Aikman, Carson, Moon, the great Rayfield Wright, and the others, Madden, of course. And I wanted to say hello once again to the great players behind me in whose glory we all shared those legends. And it has always, as Harry Carson said, brought a realization to the Raiders that we owe a debt to these great people behind us. And as I said before, the Raiders will never forget that debt.
But let's go back to Oakland for a moment. Let's go back to the 1970s. Let's fill that stadium one more time with the staff and the administrative people who poured their heart and soul into the Raiders. Let's go back to the great Raider warriors who are here today and to those who are no longer with us but whose memories we cherish and those great Raider warriors who are watching up there today who will lead us in the future. I say, let's line you up under the goalpost one more time. One more time. And have you introduced all individually once again to Raw of that Oakland crowd. We can never forget those great moments. The Raw would be deafening to see you trot out in those black jerseys, those silver helmets. John Madden, the chill goes through my body as I hear that roar and think of all those special people. But see you, John, down on the sidelines, prowling those sidelines, yelling at officials, that flaming red hair, those arms moving left and right, screaming at Raider players, and most of all, winning football games. But that is fantasy. And fantasy isn't the answer here today. But what is not fantasy is you coming up to this podium to be enshrined into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, the great John Madden. think of you know what it would be like if you ever enshrined into the Hall of Fame and people say what will you do when you get up to the podium and I tell them I don't know I'll tell you when I get up there and I and right now I don't have a lot of I mean I, I got like numb you know like I, mean, I, I tingle you know from the bottom of my toes to the the top of my head I mean this is so special uh, you know all the guys talk about who's gonna you know break up I started to break up when Al Davis was talking, and uh, so I, you know, if they have a contest or any bet, I knew I was going to lose that that one anyway. But I just wanted to take this this first moment just to to make a memory and you know say how special this feeling is. You know, I mean, to be in here, you know, in Canton with these great people of Canton, Ohio. I mean, you can't believe the job that they do. It's not only today, I mean, the game, the the parade. I mean, they have 100,000 people at the parade at 8 o'clock in the morning. I mean, this, this is a special place. And this is a celebration of football. And when you celebrate, celebrate pro football, it has to be here in Canton, Ohio, because this is where the NFL started. And I want to thank you people and, and all the pro football fans and the pro football writers that that voted me into the Hall of Fame, led by you know Frank Cooney and Ira Miller, a special thanks to them. But you know everyone that made that possible. It was a long wait, but it was a, a wait that you know when you finally get in, it's made it all worthwhile because the feeling is so special and you appreciate it so much more. 
And and the class that I go in with, I mean, Harry Carson and Raphael Wright and Warren Moon and, you know, Reggie White and Sarah, uh, uh, you know, is, is and Troy Aikman, is such a, such a great thing, and I'm proud to be in this class because we're always going to be connected with each other. We'll always be, you know, the class of 2006, and that'll be forever. And I'll tell you, these are all good people, good guys, and I am proud as hell to go into this 2006 Hall of Fame class with these guys. These are, these are good. And more than people. And then, you know, the Hall of Famers behind me, that's what it's all about. You know, I was, I was reading the, the NFL stats in history book, and... And that's what when you, you do when you ride a bus, when you don't fly, you read you know, big, big old thick books like that. But they had a chapter uh, on history. And the first page in the chapter of history was a list of the Hall of Famers. And I said, that's right, they got it. That is our history. The players that played before us, the players that played when they didn't have face masks, when they had leather helmets, when got this thing started. The players that played in smaller stadiums, you know, didn't have the medical thing, didn't have anything. They laid the foundation for this great game, and we should never forget it. I say to NFL teams that you ought to honor your history more. Sometimes we tend to get caught up in the players and the games now. Honor your history. Bring, bring back the Hall of Famers. Bring back their teammates. Let the fans show their appreciation to their history. Because I know that, you know, going in with these guys is, is, is so special. And, you know, we always talk about immortality, you know, and uh, some, some of us think maybe we will be immortal, that we'll live forever. But you know, when you really think about it, we're not going to be. But I say this, and this is overwhelming and mind-blowing, that through this bust with these guys... In that hall, we will be forever. And you know, when you think of that, it just blows your mind. That it's forever and ever and ever. And you have to stay with me a moment on this one. This is a little goofy here. And you're going to say, oh, there's old Madden being, being goofy again. But I started thinking about this after I got voted into the Hall of Fame. And the more I think about it, the more I think it's true. And now I know it's true and I believe it. Here's the deal. I think... Over in the Hall of Fame, that during the day, the people go through, and they look at everything. And then at night, there's a time when they all leave. And all the fans and all the visitors leave the Hall of Fame. Then there's just the workers, and the workers start to leave. And then it gets down, there's just one person. And that person turns out the light, locks the door. I believe that the bus talk to each other. And I can't wait for that conversation. I really can't. To Vince LaBarge, to Newt Rodney, to, you know, to Reggie, to Walter Payton, to the, to the guys that you want to say, with, to, to all my players, my ex-players, you know, we, we'll, we'll be there forever and ever and ever talking about you know, whatever. And, and that's, that's what I believe, and that's what I think is going to happen, and no one's ever going to talk me out of that. Those guys back here all going, oh, no, I don't have to put up with this BS for eternity. <laughs> but this, this is a celebration, and, and it should be fun, and you know, it has to be great. And to, to have Al Davis here is something special. I mean, if it weren't for Al, well, I wouldn't be here. And, you know, he was the guy that gave me an opportunity. He was the guy that hired me 40 years ago, brought me into pro football. He was the guy that made me a head coach when I was 32 years old. And I had two years of pro coaching experience. Now that's where, who the heck names a guy 32 years old as a head coach? Al Davis did. But he not only named me head coach, but he stood behind me. And he helped me. And he, and he, provided, he provided me with players, with great players. As he was saying, nine of the players were in the Hall of Fame. I mean, those are the types of players that he provided me with. And he stood behind me, not only the 
10 years I was a head coach, but he stood behind me for the last 40 years. And, and Al Davis is a friend, always has been a friend. I remember I had the, the opportunity to induct him into the Hall of Fame. And, and at the time, I said, you know, talking about loyalty and what a guy Al Davis was, I said that he's the guy that, you know, if you had anything happen, you had one phone call, who would you make that phone call to? I said it would be Al Davis. All these years later, I had an opportunity. I got voted into the Hall of Fame. I had a phone call to make for a presenter, and I called Al Davis. And I just talked to my mom, and you know she's watching. And you know, hi, mom, I love you. And I know she. I was talking about how excited I am, and how I haven't slept in three days, and you know, my mind is mushing. She just said, "Me too." <laughs> and she has the same feelings, and you know, and, and she's not right here, but she's here in spirit, and uh, 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 she's a special person that's been with me, you know, for 70 years of my life, and I know that my dad, who died in the 1960s, is up there looking down and, and laughing. And my mom's probably laughing right now, too, because when I was a, like a sophomore in high school, I was playing in summer baseball, and I was playing on three or four different teams. And I told my dad, I'm going to drop a couple of these because I want to get a job to make some money. And my dad said, now nah. I said, I'll give you a couple bucks. Go caddy, make a few loops, and you'll be okay. He said, uh, uh, don't work. He said, because once you start work, you're going to have to work the rest of your life. And my dad worked hard. He was a mechanic, and he worked hard. And, you know, and I'm, the reason I say that, that he's up there laughing right now is because I listened to him, and I continued to play, and I have never worked a day in my life. I went from player to coach to a broadcaster, and I am the luckiest guy in the world. And my sisters, Dolores and Judy, you know, they were, they were there with me. They supported, you know, everything that I did because life with me as a kid was just a locker room. Uh, every day was recess. And, and they knew that, and they went along with it and supported everything. And, and I love them, and I appreciate that. If there was a Hall of Fame for, for families, my family would be in the Hall of Fame. My wife, Virginia, my two sons, Joe and Mike. Uh, you know, they talk about, about how hard coaches work. You know, and they work 18, 20 hours a day. They sleep on a couch. They don't come home. And you know, That's not the hard job. The hard job is a coach's wife, believe me. The job of the coach's wife is she has to be mother, father, driver, doctor, nurse, coach, everything. Because the coach is out there working. So, you know, when anyone is appreciated, they have to appreciate the wife. And I had the greatest, in, and I have the greatest in Virginia. Thank you. Stand up. You deserve it. After all those years, but no, you deserve to stand up and take a bow on this day. And my two sons, Mike and Joe, I'm, I'm so proud of them. They're, they're not only my two sons, but they're my two best friends. And, uh, uh, you know, just everything that they do. I, I used to, you know, when they were kids, I used to take them to, to practice on Saturdays, not take them to the Pro Bowl. And I coached coach. Pro Bowl way too damn many times, but I used to take them to the Pro Bowl and the Super Bowl, you know, every time I could, and and those were those were special times. As I look back now, you know, my coaching career, you know, I think of my family, and I think of the days that you know we spent together. And I say this to coaches everywhere: if you ever have a chance to take your kids with you, take them. Don't miss that opportunity. Because when it's all over and done with, and you look back, those are going to be your fondest memories. And when you go into Hall of Fame at my age, then you have kids who have wives, and then they have kids. So uh, Mike's wife is Noel, Joe's wife is Wendy. And then between them, 
They've given me five grandkids that I love to death, and they're the love of my life. They're five, four, three, two, one, Sam, Jack, Jesse, Aiden, and McKenna. And, and that's, that's what it's all about. It's about family and, you know, and having them and having them here with your team. You know, I know I go into the Hall of Fame as a coach, and I know that I go into the Hall of Fame because of my players and what they did. And I'm so proud, you know, Al already introduced the players that are in the Hall of Fame behind me. If they just stand up, but all my players that are out there, there's between 30 and 40 X-rated players. Play, all stand up. Stand up. My family, stand up. Stand up. Just take your day. Just say, I mean, you remember him. I mean, you remember Cliff France. You remember Phil Villapiano. You remember Big Ben Davidson. You remember all these guys, John Bella, Henry Lawrence, all these guys that did all these things. And no, no, stay up, stay up. This is our day in the sun. Doggone it, take it. You know, I mean, if we're here, stay up and take it, and you guys stand up and take it too. Let's, I mean, I mean, Fred Blitnikoff, the whole, the whole thing, Big Ben Davidson there. I mean, these, these are the guys, this is what it was all about. These are, these are the guys that, you know, I go in here and, and, no, no, stand up, stand up, Ben. You, 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 all of a sudden, I mean, you know, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, they were ready to hit anything, yeah, talk anything, you know, let's go to the party, let's do all this. <laughs> now they want to sit down. Stand up, enjoy the moment. This is ours. They can't take it away from us. They can't ever take us away from us. And thanks to all you guys. I mean, the whole bunch of you, I love you. Thank you very, very much. Harvard, do you remember all those, all those great Raider names in the 70s? And we had such special fans, and, and, and the whole thing, it was just something, you know, that, you know, that I'll never forget, and something that, you know, if it weren't for them, we'll have a party after, too, so don't worry about it. We'll go through. And, you know, it's been a, a great road from Madden's Lot and Daly City with, you know, John Robinson. John, who wouldn't believe this, huh? This <laughs> is amazing and uh, you know to Jefferson High School with my first real coach Joe McGrath and then to Roy Hughes at Cal Poly and my roommate Pat Lovell is here my college roommate then to the Philadelphia Eagles and Norm Van Brocklin had a great influence on me to Hancock College with Al Baldock then to San Diego State with a with a great coach uh, that someday will be in here Don Coriel and, and he had a real influence on my, my coaching. And Joe Gibbs was on that staff, too. And then, and then we went to the Oakland Raiders. John Rouse was the head coach. Ollie Spencer, Tom Doms, Charlie Sumner. John Polanchik was there. You know, Joe Spinella, Tom Flores uh, came later. All those great coaches, John Robinson. Uh, you know, I thank you all because, again, you go in, you go in as a, as a coach, but you take your players and your assistant coaches with you. And, you know, and it's been so long that I had a pretty good road afterwards also. And, you know, I ride a bus. I don't fly. And, and the road has been with Dave Hahn, who was my first bus driver who passed away, Willie Yarbrough, Joe Mitchell. I mean, I spend so much time with them that they're part of my team now and my family. And then Sandy Montag... As my agent, he's been with me for over 20 years, and you know, I'm an agent's agent. I mean, he's a friend, and he's a, he's a very good friend, and and I thank him for everything that, that that he has done for me. And you know, and and my years at CBS and Fox were pretty good. Pat Summerall, and uh, you know, and that team, and and Bob Stenner and Sandy Grossman, and then you know, I say I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and I go to ABC and now NBC with with Al Michaels, Fred. Gudelli and Drew Esserkoff, and by the way, we have a game right over here tomorrow night, so, so this, you talk about a full weekend, I mean, man, I have dinners and parades and, you know, induction ceremonies, and then, and then a game tomorrow night, which will be broadcasting the first one that I do with, uh, with NBC. So I just want to say in closing that it's been a great ride, and I want to thank everyone who's been along for any part of it. And speaking of great rides, I was lucky enough to be carried off the field after we won Super Bowl XI. 
And I was told it took like five or six guys to lift me up, and then, and then they dropped me. But that's okay, because that was me and that was them. I mean, they aren't going to carry me off like, you know, some guy belonged to a carry. I mean, you carry him off for a while, boom, you dump him. I'm there in the gun. But it was the happiest moment of my life. And today feels like the second time in my life that I'm being carried off the shoulders of others. Yet instead of off the field, it's into the Hall of Fame. And instead of five or six guys, today I ride in the shoulders of hundreds of friends, coaches, players, colleagues, family. And I just say this, I thank you all very much. And this has been the sweetest ride of them all. Thank you. a Heisman Trophy winner. He was nine-time Pro Bowl selection with the Raiders and a wide receiver ranked in the top ten all-time in receptions, yards, and touchdowns. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Brown. I want to thank the Hall of Fame committee for bestowing this phenomenal honor on me. I also want to congratulate my fellow classmates on their induction into the Hall of Fame. To think that Ronnie Wolf from New Freedom, Pennsylvania, who graduated 101st in the class of 83 from Tuscohannock High School, is being inducted into this fabled hall is remarkable. The goddess of victory comes about only once or twice during the course of a contest. There is that moment when a play is needed to be made. These gentlemen seized that moment and exhibited that ability throughout their careers. It is truly an honor for me now to be included in their company. I would like to acknowledge my wife, Edie, who permitted me to live my dream. Thank you. My two sons, Jonathan, and you've met Elliot, Elliot's wife, Reagan. My three daughters, Sarah and husband, Paul. Shelly and husband, Steve. Joan, my grandson, Owen, and my brother, Guy. And that's it, folks. Further, I want to thank the current Packers organization for all their support. I had the good fortune to begin my career working for the legendary Al Davis. Not only did he set a standard of excellence for five decades in the NFL, as commissioner of the American Football League, he brought about the merger between the two leagues. I spent 24 seasons working for him and appreciate deeply all I was able to learn. He was a remarkable teacher, and I am forever in his debt for providing me with an opportunity to work in this extraordinary game. In 1990, I left the Raiders and joined the New York Jets. There I met Dick Steinberg, who taught me there are many different approaches to achieve the same goal of winning. I was able to take what I learned from him, tweak it, and use it in my next position. Around Thanksgiving of 1991, I was hired by Bob Harlan to become the Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Green Bay Packers. When I was hired by the Packers, I did not realize what a wonderful place I was moving to. The history of this magnificent franchise is unparalleled in the annals of the National Football League. Those, those great names that surround Lambeau Field epitomized excellent achieved on the gridiron. I was fortunate enough to be able to hire Mike Holmgren, 
trade for Brett Flower, sign Reggie White, and because of those three people, plus an excellent supporting cast, the Packers started to become a force once again in the NFL after over two decades of mediocrity. At that time, there was always a threat to players of other teams that if they didn't shape up, they would be traded to Green Bay. We worked hard to eliminate that stigma. Suddenly, players wanted to come and be a part of football's most illustrious franchise and to play in pro football's most storied cathedral, Lambeau Field. There are several people from the so-called Ron Wolf tree who have had great success recently in this profession, and you know who you are. I'm very proud of your accomplishments. Congratulations on all you have done for the sport of professional football. And on a personal note, thank you for all your help in resurrecting the Packers. Here's wishing you continued success as you pursue your own destiny throughout your careers in the NFL. There are several individuals who played a huge role in my life in pro football. I was very fortunate to be able to work in the AFL and NFL for 38 years and owe a great deal to too many people to mention. But I do want to thank every member of the Green Bay Packers organization from 1992 to 2001, Bill Parcells for his counsel and friendship, and Mike Ornstein for his efforts on my behalf. To succeed in this game, you have to love it, respect its history, and understand you have a responsibility to make it better. Michael Jordan said that, but the same applies to professional football. Football has such a broad appeal. I think it is the ultimate team game. It is a game of human will coupled with unbelievable athletic skill and grace. Nothing expresses that any better than watching a receiver catch a ball, tap his two feet down, inbounds for a completed pass. It is still, however, a contest of blocking, tackling, and kicking. No matter how hard people attempt to change the rules to get more scoring, it still comes down to those three basic components. To me, that is the uniqueness of the NFL and the wonderful aspect of the game of pro football. It is the reason behind the tremendous appeal the game has achieved nationally. Because this night is long, with lots of other presentations, and those of you who know me well know my reputation for extraordinarily brief speeches, as my dad would say, I love a good speaker. I really do. Not one who's polished, one who's through. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. All right, Raider Nation, I know we may be outnumbered, but I need to hear Raiders, Raiders, Raiders. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Now, I know Jerome is coming up, and he's going to blow the house out, but I had to get that in. <laughs> Oh, boy. You know, I, uh, I say to my kids every morning when I wake them up, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I was drafted by the L.A. Raiders. Mr. Ron Wolf actually drafted me into the NFL. You know, I don't know what my agent, Marvin Demoff, did to get me to the Raiders, 
you know, I heard stories like he told the teams in between that I had an aunt to die in the city or something, and I would have all these, you know, flashbacks if I had to come play there. So, but some kind of way he got me to the Raiders because that was a team that we figured I could excel in. I could excel at. And once I got there, I realized that uh, this game was a little different. I had the great James Lofton there as a wide receiver at the time, and my first day, and Mike Haynes was there also, which was not fun at all, going up against him. You know, my last year at Notre Dame, I was in the wishbone most of the time. So I, I was used to wearing very big pads. So I, I came out to practice the first day, and I had all these Dunzes, uh, pads on it. These things are huge. I mean, they're like Earl Campbell, like huge. And everybody's looking at me laughing like, dude, what are you doing? I said, man, this is how I get down. This is how I play the game. And James Lofton pulled me over and said, this is not going to work, rookie. You got to go back in and change. And I listened to him and uh, things went well. You know, I had a great rookie year. You know, uh, broke a lot of records, all that kind of stuff. But the most important thing to me, people were saying because of the Heisman jinx and all that, that maybe I couldn't get it done on that level. And the very first time I touched the ball in the NFL, I returned the kick 97 yards for a touchdown. So that was probably the best thing that could happen because all the critics went away. And now it's just a matter of going out and playing football and having a great time. But my second year, I was thrown a wrinkle. Uh, I got hurt the opening game of the year, returning the kickoff. And at this particular point, because of the injury that I have to my knee, the doctors literally told me, we don't know if we can get you walking straight. And so playing football may be something that's not in the, in the plans for you anymore. And I was shocked by that, but I worked extremely hard to get back. You know, I knew that if I kept working that maybe I couldn't be a guy that was 4-3 anymore and had all these great moves. But at the same time, you know, I felt I could play the game and be helpful to a football team. You know, I believe that ends up being the best thing that could have ever happened to me in my career. You know, I had ended up leading the Raiders in receiving because James got hurt and a couple other receivers got hurt. And I ended up leading the team in receptions. I was trying to return punts and kicks and be a receiver. And that's how I was starting out that year. But by that injury happening, all of a sudden, that was all taken away from me. It was taken away from me to the point where Al Davis came to me and said, you're going to be the best third down receiver, punt returner to ever play the game. And I was like, third down receiver, punt returner? Yeah, there's a couple downs missing in that. But that's what he meant. When he said it, he meant it. And for the next two years, I never played on first and second down. I only played on third down. I think I caught 18 passes one year, 36 passes the next year. In 92, Mervyn Fernandez gets hurt in the middle of the season, and I ended up having to take over for him and played well, and the rest is history, as they say. You know, the next five years for me went pretty good. But my really, really the reason why I'm here now and standing uh, on the precipice of, of going into the NFL, NFL Hall of Fame is because of another coach. The silver and black like to call him Chucky. I call him Brewdog. When John came to the, to the Raiders, I was going into my 11th year. And the four years I had with him were just incredible years, not just because of the numbers, but because of the games we were playing and, and the importance of the games. And so it put me out there in a totally different, uh, on a totally different level. So John, I know you were supposed to be here. I hope you're here, man. God bless you. I love you, man. And thank you for everything that you've done. You know, my football story is, is pretty unique. You know, again, I played 27 years and, you know, I only had one shot at a championship but I'm very grateful and thankful that I did have that shot. You know, when you get 34, 35, 36 in the league, you stop saying you want to win a championship. You start saying, Lord, let me play in a championship game. And I did have that opportunity, and it was, um, wasn't the experience I was looking for, but at the same time, I'm certainly glad that I had that experience. You know, leaving the Raiders was tough. My last year, I ended up playing in Tampa, and I want to thank Gruden and Bruce Allen again 
for giving me a very soft place to land because as we all know as players, when you get cut and you have to leave and go home, it's a very difficult thing. But thankfully, uh, Gruden was down in Tampa and Bruce and a whole bunch of Raiders. Uh, matter of fact, they started calling Tampa the Raiders of the East Coast. And um, so I had a very easy place to go and walk out of this game. You know, my, my football career is great. Since being selected into the Hall of Fame, I've looked back through my life wondering how and where this all started. Did I plan this journey? Was this supposed to happen? Analyzing everything I did from childhood to the present, I cannot pinpoint a place in time where I said, is this what I had to do? Did I want to play just one sport or do I want to have fun and play all of them? I never really had a teacher, a coach, or a special cap to attend to learn the art of punting. My high school coach, Paul Leroy, showed me two things about foot alignment and ball placement. And that was pretty much it. All through high school and college, I played other positions as well. I was a good athlete and could have been a major league pitcher or an NBA basketball player. But I knew God had something special for me. And eventually, one sport would stand out beyond the rest. And it did. Playing in the NFL with the Raiders was my destiny, and I never looked back or questioned my decision. After joining the Raiders, however, I realized I had to concentrate on just